welcome to the second season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow to learn about upcoming episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Robert Bierenbaum graduated from medical school in 1978 and was in surgical residency at a medical center in Brooklyn, New York. He was tall, somewhat good-looking, with dark hair, deep-set brooding dark eyes, and an angular jaw. Bob was a perfectionist who liked things his way. He spoke multiple languages, was passionate about cooking, and had his pilot's license for flying small planes. Gail Katz was a graduate student working towards her Ph.D. in clinical psychology at Long Island University. She worked part-time in Manhattan and lived with a male friend in a downtown apartment. She was petite, barely five foot three, and just over a hundred pounds. Her shoulder length hair framed her hazel brown eyes perfectly. A beautiful woman who deep down had low self esteem. When she met Bob in 1981, she was smitten and couldn't believe her luck. She thought they were the perfect match. When Gail's sister Elaine met Bob, she thought he was a good thing for her sister. He helped her focus on completing her education, but eventually he started taking over her life. He controlled how she dressed, had her quit her job, and move in with him to his posh apartment on East 85th Street on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, only four blocks from Central Park, and the nearby Metropolitan Museum of Art. In August 1982, things took a sinister turn. Gail walked into the bathroom to discover Bob trying to drown her cat because he was jealous of Gail's love for her pet. Now you think that would have been a red flag telling Gail to run, but she was in denial she thought her love could change Bob, and they had plans to get married. A month later, the couple tied the knot. She was 26, he was 27. But like many fairy tales, dark moments creep in, and Gail's fairy tale was no exception. Fourteen months into their marriage, the couple got into an argument. Bob had control issues that led to flashes of extreme anger in which he would lash out. And on numerous occasions, he had tried to strangle Gail. Then one day, he went too far. He had a strict no-smoking rule in the apartment, and when he caught Gail smoking, he flew into a rage. He grabbed her throat and squeezed. He didn't let go until she was unconscious. He revived her, apologized profusely, and called 911. Gail reported Bob to the police. Gail confided in her cousin Hillard, who told her to leave Bob immediately. For a short time, Gail moved in with her grandfather and consulted a divorce lawyer. Gail had met an investment banker in the summer of 1984, and they had an affair that lasted many months. Gail withdrew her complaint against Bob, and no charges were filed. She later returned to Bob and moved back into their apartment. The couple each began seeing a therapist. After a session with Bob, his psychiatrist, Dr. Michael Stone, 
was so alarmed that Bob was capable of killing his wife that he wrote a letter to Gail and asked her to sign it. The New York Daily News reported that it read in part, If I do not heed this advice, I must accept the consequences, including the possibility a personal injury or death at the hands of my husband. Gail didn't sign the letter, but she kept it. Gail's family and friends knew that her marriage had become toxic. She shared with a neighbor that she didn't feel comfortable at home with Bob. She told another friend, Marianne, that Bob had threatened to kill her if she left him, and that he talked about the Claus Van Bulo case, and that the problem was Claus left evidence, and that Bob, he knew better. He would leave no evidence and get away with it. Then she told her friend that she'd taken a bank loan out for $10,000 to pay for her graduate studies and hidden the money in a safety deposit box. She told her sister Elaine that if Bob didn't grant her divorce, she would use his psychiatrist's letter against him. She would show it to his superiors at work to show them that he was psychotic. Court records revealed that on Saturday, July 6, 1985, Gail attended a doctor's appointment and scheduled another appointment for December. Afterwards, she visited her hairstylist, then met with her friend Denise for a few hours. She confided that she was having an affair with a co-worker and was leaving Bob that weekend. In her hand, she had a newspaper, and in the wanted ads section, she had circled apartments for rent. Her turbulent three-year marriage to Bob was finally coming to an end. Gail returned home, and Sunday morning, she waved the psychiatrist's letter in front of Bob. They got into a huge fight. She was yelling at him. He just wanted her to stop. His anger flared when he suddenly attacked her. He wanted to silence her. He placed his hands around her neck and squeezed, his fingertips forming an airtight vice. He continued to squeeze with all 34 muscles in each hand until she fell silent. Gail was 29. Bob placed his wife's body in a large duffel bag and carried it out to his Datsun car. He drove to the Caldwell Airport in New Jersey, entered the office, and rented a Cessna 172 Skyhawk, a single-engine, four-seater plane with the wings above the cabin. He filled out a flight plan, but then changed his mind and using a different colored pen, he altered the date from the 7th to the 8th. He was able to drive his car right up to the plane, and out of the view of the rental office, he hoisted the heavy duffel bag onto the plane. He taxied down the runway, then took off flying over the Atlantic Ocean. Somewhere between Long Island and New Jersey, he opened the door and pushed the duffel bag out. It hit the water with the force of a torpedo. His flight lasted exactly one hour and 56 minutes. He drove back to his apartment, parked his Datsun, and boarded his father's Cadillac to attend a birthday party at his sister's in New Jersey. At 5.30 p.m., he departed for the hour drive. He arrived at the party alone and explained Gail's absence by saying she had gone out earlier and hadn't returned. He didn't mention to anyone about his plane flight that afternoon. 
Later that night, he stopped by a friend's house and pretended to be upset about Gail and phoned their apartment to see if she had returned. Then, near midnight, he phoned Gail's mother, asking if she had heard from her. Thirty hours after he had murdered his wife, Bob contacted the police. He told them that they'd had an argument Sunday morning and that she'd went to Central Park to cool off. She left the apartment at 11.15 a.m., and that's the last time he saw her. He told them she had been wearing pink shorts, a white t-shirt, and sandals. Detective Virgilio Del Ses from the local precinct and Detective Thomas O'Malley from the Missing Persons Bureau were assigned to Gail's case. Detective Virgilio tried calling Bob and left eight messages on his answering machine. Two days later, Bob called Detective Tom to ask if there was any progress. Tom asked why he'd waited so long to report his wife missing, and Bob explained that he thought she would return, and that Gail was depressed and suicidal. Authorities searched Central Park along the border of the Upper East Side, and Bob and Gail's friends and family distributed posters. Yvette, a friend of Gail's, stopped by the apartment and noticed the living room rug was gone and asked Bob about it. He brushed it off, saying the cat had soiled the rug and it was being cleaned. On Sunday, July 14th, it had been exactly seven days since Gail disappeared. Her father, Emmanuel, visited Central Park and questioned the regulars. She was attractive, and he thought surely someone must have noticed her, but not one person had seen her. Detective Virgilio finally caught up with Bob. Court records state that he told the detective that the night before, he and Gail had had a romantic candlelight dinner, and that on Sunday morning, she had received a phone call that upset her. They argued, and she left, and that he was home all afternoon until he left at 5.30 for a family birthday party. He failed to tell the investigator that he'd rented an airplane for an afternoon flight. Detective Virgilio asked Bob if they could take a look around the apartment, and Bob said he'd get back to him, but he didn't. Instead, he avoided the detectives. Eleven days after their daughter disappeared, Gail's parents feared she was dead. Detectives talked to Gail's friends and her therapist. Bob put up a thousand dollar reward for information that would help them find Gail, and he hired a private investigator. Finally, at the end of September, Detective Virgilio got permission from Bob's lawyer to search the apartment. But it was limited to Gail's diary, address book, and fingerprints. Police did not have enough evidence for a search warrant, so they could not search for blood. The limited scope of their search did not reveal any clues. Three weeks after Gail disappeared, Bob started dating a co-worker at the hospital. He told Karen that the private investigator he'd hired found evidence that Gail was in California and working as a waitress. And he told Gail's friend Ellen that Gail's therapist had told him that she was suicidal. And while on vacation in the Hamptons, he told someone that Gail had a drug problem and had run off with a drug dealer. Then he told another person that he went looking for Gail in Central Park. He didn't find her, but he did find her towel and suntan lotion. The New York Post described how in October, 
Elaine arrived at the Bierenbaum apartment to pick up her sister's belongings. And Bob had thrown them into trash bags, and that enraged her. She screamed at him, You killed her! You can't have her things! Elaine funneled her anger into a letter-writing campaign. She targeted Bob's employers, his co-workers, his neighbors, stating that, according to my brother-in-law, Gail simply walked out. Now he's hired a lawyer and isn't helping to find her. You live with him. You work with him. Please put pressure on him so he could be more forthcoming. In the fall, Bob began seeing Roberta, an anesthesiologist. He told her that Gail had run off with someone and was in the Caribbean. It had been 14 months in September 1986 when Hope Martin, an investigator with the district attorney's office, was assigned to Gail's case. She learned that Bob was a licensed pilot and set out to find out if he had flown a plane the day his wife disappeared. She discovered that, in fact, he had. Forensic examinations were performed on the plane, Bob's Datsun, and his father's Cadillac. But after all those months, they found no evidence. In April 1987, the investigation was closed. Gail's family knew Bob had murdered her, and so did the detectives and the prosecution. But they couldn't risk a trial with no evidence, no witnesses, and no body. Then, four years later in May 1989, a torso washed up on the shores of Staten Island. An X-ray technician compared a chest X-ray from Gail to the torso and declared it a match. Gail's family finally had a body to bury. They had closure. Bob left New York in 1990 and started a medical practice in Las Vegas. There he met another doctor, Stephanie Youngblood. They were together for three years until his rage resurfaced. She suggested they see a therapist. Stephanie was advised by the therapist that her life was in danger and recommended she end the relationship. Stephanie took the therapist's advice and left Bob. In 1995, he married a Las Vegas doctor named Janet Shalott. The couple moved to Minot, North Dakota, there, he grew a successful practice. He now owned his own plane and flew to Mexico, where he donated his time performing corrective surgery for impoverished children. Twelve years later, in 1997, lead prosecutor Andrew Rosenwig was nearing retirement and couldn't forget Gail's case. He picked up the phone and called her sister, Elaine, and told her he wanted to reopen the case and convinced her family to exhume the torso that they had buried. Now, with DNA testing, it was revealed that it did not belong to Gail. Investigators re-interviewed everyone, new witnesses, and girlfriends, including Stephanie. Bob's inconsistent explanation of Gail's disappearance to multiple people, coupled with the plane he rented, now was enough for prosecutors to finally file charges. On December 8, 1999, Bob was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. He pled not guilty and was released on a $500,000 bond. The prosecution had one last hurdle. How to prove Bob flew the plane while burying Gail's body at sea? They arranged for a member of the New York Police Department's aviation unit to fly a Cessna 172 from the Caldwell Airport and throw a 110-pound duffel bag 
filled with sand and rice, out of the plain. Three flights were made over the Atlantic Ocean. Each time, the pilot used a different maneuver. On one flight, he placed a duffel bag on the passenger seat, took his hands off the control wheel, reached across the cockpit, opened the passenger door, and pushed the duffel bag out. On another, he pulled the bag over his lap, opened the pilot's door, and dropped it straight down into the ocean. The trial began in October 2020 and lasted two weeks. The defense tried to portray Gail as someone with mental health issues and drug addiction. But her sister Elaine refuted this. Her testimony was crucial. As the jurors listened intently, she provided the courtroom with the motive for Bob to murder Gail. How she had planned on using the psychiatrist's letter against him in their divorce. Witnesses testified as to Bob's inconsistent explanations for his wife's disappearance. She was a drug addict, had run off to California or the Caribbean, and that therapist that Bob claimed told him Gail was suicidal. The therapist denied saying that to Bob, and in fact, he said Gail was not suicidal. The jury was shown the flight logs with the date that had been altered and were shown the video of the police pilot throwing a duffel bag out of the plane. That was enough to convince the jury. It took them less than six hours to find Bob guilty. In the courtroom, his face showed no emotion as he bowed his head. Bob's wife Janet kissed her husband and wished him good luck. The New York Post reported that Gail's sister Elaine said, I heard the cuffs close around his hands. I've waited for that sound a long time. Bob was sentenced to 20 years to life. Over the years, he filed three appeals. All were denied. Then in 2020, he dropped a bombshell. At his parole hearing, he confessed to killing Gail 35 years ago. And the details were exactly how the prosecution had said it happened. Bob's parole was denied. His next parole hearing is scheduled for June 2022. To honor her sister, Elaine worked with the nonprofit organization Pace Women's Justice Center and it was rebranded and named Gail's House. She told ABC News, My sister's body has never been found. Gail doesn't rest anywhere. Gail's house gave my sister a resting place. I feel my sister's spirit is here, warning others, inspiring others. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Arthur Halverson. He headed west to California, where he made a living any way he could, most of it illegal. About to lose his house, the financial pressures mounted. He snapped. An hour later, Two lay dead, and two more were injured. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com or check us out on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.